afternoon. Uh, welcome to the DCA Fall Virtual Conference. My name is Bridget McGee and I manage the Homeownership Division at DCA. The topic for this session is GIG and we're pleased to have Kristen Cherry, our GIG Housing Policy Analyst, to lead the discussion today along with experts from three of our GIG communities. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to address. Uh, please be sure to keep your mic muted during the presentation. If you called in on your cell phone, you'll also have to mute it. Um, if you have any questions during the session, feel free to type them into the chat. We will save all questions until the end and read them during the Q&A portion of the presentation. Otherwise, there will be an opportunity for you to use the raise your hand function during the Q&A session. You'll see it over to the right on the menu. The session will be recorded and will be available after the conference to you and others who were unable to attend today's session. You will receive an evaluation immediately following the presentation and it will also be emailed to, to you. Please complete it because we do value your feedback. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Kristen to get it all started. Thanks so much, Brenda and Dana. I am going to share my screen here and hopefully this works. Let's see. Are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Awesome. making sure that you're still able to see my screen in full mode. Uh, we're looking at the PowerPoint. All right. Let's get this corrected. Okay. Just give me one second here. All right, hopefully you all are able to see the PowerPoint presentation here. I'm going to assume that you all can. If not, just type something here in the chat box for me and I'll try to- We're good, we can see it. Awesome. All right, so um, my name is Kristen Cherry. I am a housing policy analyst here um, with the Department of Community Affairs and happy to be here. Um, to talk with you uh, a bit about the GIG program. So I have my contact information here on the screen, um, but I'll have it at the end as well for you all to have um, in case you have any questions after our session has concluded. So um, just a quick rundown of what we're going to be covering here today before we get started. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about what GIC is, um, and then we're going to hear from the experts um, from three of our communities, and we'll leave time here at the end. Um, I see a note. Um, let me make sure that I am showing full presentation mode for you all. Just give me one moment. Looks like I'm having a bit of trouble here to get presentation mode. Thank you for y'all's patience while I get this squared away. Hear 
All right, while I try to get this figured out, I'm going to just advance the slides um, on the PowerPoint screen. And then once I'm able to show my full presentation, I'll switch over to that, but I don't want to um, delay us with the time. Um, so I'm going to keep going here. Just give me one moment. Sorry about that. All right, are you all seeing the full presentation mode now? Perfect. Awesome. Let's go. All right, um, so before we get started here, um, just a fun poll that I want to pose to you all. If, um, if you are familiar with GIG, then you probably know the answer here, um, but wanted to just test our knowledge um, and start with what does GIG even stand for? Um, so, do you think that it stands for A, Georgia Institute for Creating Healthy Communities, um, B, which doesn't quite line up with GIG, but I want to mention that I am a Falcons fan, and so um, the last few weeks have not been, been fun for me, and so I'm going to chalk that up to the fact that Georgia sports are indeed cursed, if any of you all can help, would love that. Um, or do you think that it stands for C, the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing? Um, Dana, I believe that you are gonna launch the poll here and let folks chime in for a couple of seconds. I'm getting that pulled up now for you for a second. Thank you. Kristen, I'm having trouble getting it to launch. Do you want to keep going and then we can pull it up after? Yeah, absolutely. Let's keep going. And I see folks already typing into the chat box, so that's perfectly fine. Um, we have mostly all C, so it looks like um, folks are probably familiar with the program. Um, but if you guess C, you're correct. It stands for the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing. And so what is GIG, as we call it? Um, really what it is, is a collaborative initiative between the folks you see here on the screen. Um, so it was uh, born many, many years ago, um, a small pilot project. And um, these are the partners who have really um, worked to keep the initiative going. So um, the University of Georgia, which kind of houses um, the program, and obviously us here at DCA helped to provide um, levels of technical assistance and some other items, um, as well as Georgia Municipal Association and Georgia Power, which are um, great partners in keeping GIG up and running. And so um, because I want to keep this brief, I've tried to kind of chalk up GIG to the items here on the screen, right? So my quick elevator speech on what exactly is GIG. So now that you know what it stands for, what, what does it mean? What goes into the program? Um, so here are a couple of things that I want you to take away from uh, today's presentation. First, I um, want you to know that GIG is a three-year program, right? And really what it's centered on is technical assistance and capacity building um, for communities all over the state, really looking to address um, specific affordable housing planning efforts. Um, so you would apply to be part of the program, you would enter the program as a freshman and matriculate through the program essentially as you were in school um, through your junior year. After that third year, you would graduate from the program um, and assuming you have successfully completed the program and hopefully still working towards achieving some of the goals you have set forth. So know that it is a three-year program. You should also know that in those three years, um, participants attend two retreats a year for those three years. So one in the fall and one in the spring. And what this does is pull together all of our current communities. So at any one time, we are normally uh, dealing with 
15 communities, so five freshmen, five sophomore, and five juniors. And then it also pulls together our alumni of the program. So folks who have completed um, the three-year program are invited to attend these retreats as well. And the retreats um, are really a way to share information, right? So we have lots of um, presentations from subject matter experts on topics that we hear from our communities, um, from our partner agencies that were just mentioned on the previous screen. So we discuss things like air property, um, blight tags, um, anything from you know, state grant programs to local programs, et cetera. So it's really a way for us to take all of this great information and over the span of two to three days, share it with our participating communities. It's also a way for get communities um, kind of pre-COVID, they were able to um, network and really meet each other and learn from each other what work for one community might be helpful for another community. So we love those retreats. We just finished our first ever virtual retreat in September, which um, I think went really well, but those are really key uh, to the gig program. And as you can imagine though, uh, two retreats a year, while they're important, it's not very many times to kind of gather and work on what you're planning to achieve, right? So the real work we see happens in between those retreats back in respective communities. So they generally host regular team meetings um, to really establish and start making headway on what we call a housing work plan. And those work plans just really set goals um, centered on affordable housing and uh, help to keep our communities on track on what they want to achieve by the end of the three-year program and even beyond uh, graduation from the three-year program. And so you should also know that each of those communities um, is also paired with a facilitator from one of those organizations I mentioned on the previous screen. And uh, that facilitator does just what it sounds like, right? They help to facilitate meetings. Um, they're there really as a subject matter expert on all things housing. Any questions that communities might have around uh, grant programs or uh, just certain affordable housing issues in general, that facilitator is there to help answer questions um, and help kind of steer them in the right directions towards their goals. So that's a really key component of the GIG program as well. And then the last item that I think is important to mention, um, you see there at the bottom of your screen, is that folks who participate in the GIG program, right, so they have that GIG designation, they're able to receive special consideration um, in DCA program applications. And what that, and you know, I could do a whole presentation on what that means, but just very briefly, I think it's important to note that those applications include uh, the CHIP grant, so Community Home Investment Program, um, the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, LIHTC. Um, so with that GIG designation, you're able to receive special consideration for those grant applications here at DCA. And that looks different for each grant program. Um, and we don't really have the time to go into that, but um, do know that that gift designation is important for that special consideration. And so that was really a kind of quick and dirty on what gig is. And um, while I think this is important to know, I think that um, our currently participating communities kind of have the best information to share. So I've asked that um, three of our communities, the city of Adel, the city of Centerville, and the city of Norcross, um, come and really share their experiences um, in the GIG program and talk about the work that they're doing, uh, the work that they plan to do, and just talk about some lessons learned. So uh, we're gonna have the city of Adel talk about their experience first. Um, and so Mr. Randy Lane is going to talk about the city of Adel and their work plan. Um, Randy, I'm going to advance the slides for you. So if you just want to give me a next when you're ready for me to go to the next slide, I'd be happy to do that for you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Randy Lane. I'm the Community Development Director in Adel and also the GIC team leader. Um, can you advance the slide, please? Our vision statement and mission statement is to develop and implement creative community-based strategies to enhance economic opportunity, build strong neighborhoods, and ensure a framework for quality growth and development. And our vision statement is to foster a vibrant, prosperous, and growing city throughout through community development. Next slide. 
in 2019, uh, we had a housing survey done, housing study done. We found out that the medium home value in Adel was 82,500. The median gross rent in the city limits of Adel is 963. We have three targeted areas of housing for the redevelopment. Next slide. And I actually didn't put it in, but I'm going to tell you about those three areas. There's a total of 390 homes in that three area targeted area and um, 121 homes in that area is single family mo or mobile homes dilapidated or 31 percent of them. And then the, uh, the other deteriorated is single family mobile home is 136, which is 35 percent. Our total housing stock in Adel is 2,353. Uh, and if you haven't found out yet, once you become a member of GIC, you got uh, senior housing and all kinds of people wanting to talk to you about putting some housing developments in. So we, we were fortunate enough this year to have two projects that they want to put in Adel. Of course, uh, project number two is the one we gave the letter to to give them the extra point. But um, I mean, they will tear your front door down trying to get to you. And that's a good thing. Next slide, please. And some of the things we've done since we've created, uh, went to, was actually joined GIC, was uh, create, we had a part-time city officer that did code enforcement. So the GIC team, we wanted a um, full-time proactive person. So the city agreed to fulfill a full-time city marshal position. We have targeted 10 homes in the three, count, uh, three target area. And they're ready for demolition. We're working with our city attorney to do that. Myself and the city marshals attending the GACE for code enforcement certification. We, uh, the city council agreed to uh, apply for, and we created an urban redevelopment plan. That's going to help us with our targeting with the dilapidated houses in there. And that's actually citywide. We also created a enterprise zone. We had our second annual cleanup is uh, September 21st through the 25th. And we um, picked up 67 tons of debris and 177 tires. We're in the process of finishing up our chip grant. We have three homes that we're going to rehabilitate. Once we got involved with looking at them and inspecting, we found out all of them had lead. So that's going to jump the price up some, but uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to be able to do three homes. And we're very excited about that. And also we plan on applying for a CDBG housing grant in 2021 for rehabilitation and demolition. Next slide, please. And that's all I have. There's my contact information if you like it. It's kind of short and sweet, but to the point. We're Thanks, gonna have, Randy. We're going to have questions afterwards, you say, Kristen? That's exactly right. Yeah, we're going to have some time at the end um, to ask questions. But if you all have questions now, feel free to type them in to the chat box. We'll just flag them um, and bring them back up at the at the end. Excuse me. So thanks so much, Randy. Um, yes, ma'am. Next, we have the city of Centerville, uh, Ms. Kate Hogan. Just let me know if you want me to advance your slides. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with um, DCA. My name is Kate Hogan, and I am the Director of Economic Development for the city of Centerville. Um, and you can go to the next slide. I'm also the team leader for our GIC team. So our vision, we are a um, wrapping up our sophomore year. We're entering into our junior year of the program and our vision is the Centerville housing team strives to support Centerville residents with their homes by building community pride and educating the public on housing resources. In addition, the Centerville housing team will promote housing that is available, attractive, and attainable. We also um, developed a logo to go along with our endeavor and the picture on the screen is actually a neighborhood where we, they are beautiful homes back there and their sign was not representative of the quality of homes and quality of residents. So we um, tore that sign down and we rebuilt it as far as giving in a new coat of paint, new letters. We removed a bunch of old landscaping, put out a fresh coat of pine straw, um, removed all of the graffiti and it has been up for about a year and really helped the neighborhoods have more pride in place for their neighborhood. You can go to the next slide. So in 2018, before we joined the GIC program, we actually um, completed a housing assessment and that was the basis for our application. Entering into the, entering into the 
Git program, though, we realized that we were kind of ahead of the curve. So we didn't necessarily have to have the housing assessment for our application, but it definitely allowed for us to hit the ground running to use that housing assessment as a springboard for all of our housing activities and what the housing team wanted to accomplish. So the city of Centerville is roughly four square miles. We're surrounded on two and a half sides by the city of Warner Robins, located in Houston County. Um, we're a highly urbanized area. We serve as a bedroom community for Warner Robins and Macon Metropolitan Statistical Area. We have about 2,900 structures within the city of Centerville, our median of living structures. Our median home value is $146,300. And our median gross rent is $962 a month, which is extremely high for middle Georgia. We had five target areas for redevelopment. You'll see those are delineated with yellow stars on your screen. Those areas were predominantly um, mobile home parks. So map 13 and 19 are our target areas right now. And that is a Spring Lake trailer park. Of our, during our housing assessment of the 2,900 total parcels, um, our structure is identified, 1,300 of those were identified as in excellent condition, 1,000 of those were in good condition. We only had 10 structures throughout the city that were failing, so we were able to really have some very targeted efforts on specific properties with our code enforcement officer. And you can go to the next slide. So one of our biggest accomplishments actually happened earlier this year, and it's based off of a concept that um, Thomasville implemented. But as Randy mentioned, low-income housing tax credit projects, they want to work with GIT communities. They think um, with our point, it's very competitive. And so we found ourselves before the GIT program just in a really um, uncomfortable position, to be honest, where our community felt like we were soliciting these developers to bring in Section 8 and low-income housing that was going to bring more crime to our area and also um, diminish their property values. We decided to take the bull by the horns and make sure that we guided that conversation a little bit better. And that's why we joined the GIC program. So the culmination of all of that is we've decided to develop a criteria on how and when we give our GIC point to a developer. So the GIC point process, again, it was based off of the city of Thomasville, Jermaine Durham, with GIC and his staff have our concept or my contact information, I don't mind giving it to you to um, share this concept. It's just a really easy way to have a very objective criteria when awarding these points and making sure that you're leveraging these developers for the needs of your community, whether that's infrastructure projects, stormwater, et cetera. But our GIC point process was based off of developer experience, project approach, streetscape, architectural aesthetics, connectivity, location, civic green, and recreational space, mixed use, housing choice and inclusiveness, economic and sociological impact, and innovation. The um, concept that you guys see on your screen right now is a 156 unit urban greenfield um, project that is currently pending with the Department of Community Affairs for review for a LIHTC project. This has been, it'll be a multi-phase project, but this has been such an incredible opportunity for us to rehabilitate a mall property within the city of Centerville. It's in our major commercial district for the city of Centerville, city of Warner Robins in Northern Houston County um, along Watson Boulevard. That's a eight acre green parcel that was reserved in 1993 for a, another anchor for that mall. It's a 500,000 square foot mall and it was not developed over the years. We've partnered with mall management and ownership in order to bring this concept to fruition. They received our GIC point and we're looking forward to hopefully having a few um, GIC points given to the same developers. They can finish phases two and three should they be awarded in December. But we can't say in, enough good things about how the GIC program has really allowed for us to have the resident knowledge, council knowledge, and staff knowledge on how to deal with these projects so that we can all understand that everybody's entitled to a quality place to live. And this workforce housing is incredibly important to our economic development strategy. You can go to the next slide. Other notable activities that we've had, we did three neighborhood entry revitalization projects, like the first picture that you saw. 
We did an outreach event in the Spring Lake trailer park area. That is a picture you see right there last December. We actually provided a hot meal to everybody in that trailer park. And we did a quick survey to try to understand exactly what their needs were. We partnered with our local Methodist church and they were fantastic. They pulled out all the stops. They had a big dinner for everybody, encouraged people to take extras home for their family. We served about 120 meals. It was an incredible opportunity. Um, and the, the surveys were great. It was it was interesting because a lot of people we would have figured were transient, but then there were a ton of people who were like, well, we've lived here for 10 years and we really don't need anything. We're stable. We love to see the cops ride through. Um, some mental health resources were needed as to be expected, but it was a great opportunity to get into the community and the community was um, very, very excited just to see people wanting to invest in their part of the community. We also in that same trailer park did a demolition rebate agreement where we waived the demolition costs for dilapidated trailers to be pulled out by the new ownership of that trailer park. They removed a total of 20 trailers and um, it's looking a lot better. We're also partnering with them to upgrade all of the street lights and that project is currently underway. Flint Energies is working on developing that um, or implementing that. We are also working with um, our co-enforcement and community development hand in hand trying to target it from the human approach while also having the necessary co-enforcement for surrounding properties. Again, we did some survey, surveying for our residents. We do an annual cleanup day. We do about 27 tons of trash during those. That's about April every year. We've been doing that for much longer than we've been participating in the gig program, but it was a great opportunity to capitalize on adding a little bit more purpose to that event. For 2021, we will be doing both a CHIP and a CDBG application for that Spring Lake Trailer Park area, maps 13 and 19. You can go to the next slide. And that's it for me. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Um, so next we have the city of Norcross, which actually just um, graduated from the program in September. Ms. Layla Polaka, I think we have here on the phone. Just let me know when you want me to advance your slides. Hi, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so yes, you can please um, go to the next slide. So city of um, what I want to achieve today is just to kind of tell you a little bit about uh, what our accomplishments have been and what we've done since we concluded um, our GIC uh, program just uh, last month. And then um, we really want to uh, build on the momentum that we have achieved so far. So we developed a strategy to move forward to make sure that our, um, that our the, the results and the success from the program endures. Okay, next please. So city of Norcross, let me just tell you a little bit about the city of Norcross and I think why our uh, GIC team and the, our GIC experience has been a little different um, than most of the other GIC participants. As um, one of the you know, older Gwinnett County communities, um, city of Norcross, we're really not dealing with a lot of um, blight as most of the other uh, GIC cities have. Um, our predominant issues have been, you know, the, uh, the separation of um, households and the um, areas, uh, basically by highway splitting the city into two, and how do we cross, um, how do we connect these two communities, also while addressing the housing needs of both, which uh, when we did the housing study with Dr. Watkins from UGA, um, it gave us, it, it shed some light on some of the challenges that we were facing. Um, and just to give you a little bit of the background in the city of Norcross, um, the reason why we uh, chose two census tracts um, in this in this city is um, they housed um, vast majority, almost all of the city's renters were located in these two census tracts and um, 70 to 75 percent rental rates. So it's been, a, it's a really high transiency um, area. Um, so the main goal really was for us to come and first find out more about, about the city of Norcross, about the communities, you know, what the needs are, um, and also how, how do we uh, affect the, the transiency? How do we reduce that? Um, how can we create more permanent 
housing solutions for the residents, whether they live in extended stays or in the apartment complexes. So that was basically our goal coming in. But then as we started to learn more about the community, our program shifted a little bit. Um, the Live Norcross, you know, our first accomplishment was just branding. Um, we work with the city's PR company and um, we wanted to create a logo and a brand that corresponds with um, the city of Norcross, uh, which is uh, a place to imagine. So we created Live Norcross, a home to imagine because this is a housing oriented program. And like I stated, um, sometimes I think city of Norcross through no fault of their own, yeah, when they annex these areas that used to be outside of their city limits, it's basically become like a, um, a tale of two cities. And um, so our desire was to, for the Norcross to feel like a home to all of our residents, regardless of where they live. Um, and just to kind of creating a more inclusive community along both sides of the Buford Highway, which kind of acts as the divider between the two different areas. Okay, so next, please. So we divided our work into several committees. The first committee is the home ownership committee. How do we bring up home ownership? Uh, how do we increase home ownership rates in the city? And of course, we couldn't see tremendous results um, in that in just a just the three years, but some of the programs that we brought have helped a lot of families. Um, the first one is we partner with the Summer Hour Middle School, and um, they were instrumental in helping us uh, share the information with, with their students. Um, City of Norcross, 40% um, of the population is actually Hispanic, and 44% of the City of Norcross population speaks um, a language other than English at home. So it's a very diverse community and it's really like a microcosm of Gwinnett County. Um, so we made sure that all of our communication has been uh, translated into Spanish. And our first housing expo uh, really showed that there was a lack of uh, information. And um, so we wanted to bring all of the resources to the community and we, um, we had the exhibitors were the nonprofits who provide down payment assistance and affordable housing. We also had Metro Fair Housing come and talk about the, the rights uh, for the tenants under the uh, Georgia law. We brought in you know, a mortgage uh, bank and a, a, just a commercial bank for those that were under banks to talk about their um, banking products and also second chance banking. We also brought Gwinnett Tech Workforce Investment Act, and they talked about their um, careers that, you know, just with a simple certificate um, for people to increase their wages. And the reason why we brought this exhibitor is, again, learning about your community, we realized that the poverty rates in these two census tracts were twice the county levels. Um, so basically, with the Housing Expo, we really wanted to focus on those that are inter interested in the home ownership. We wanted to talk to those that are in the apartments, um, you know, what their rights are. And we also, those that are possibly um, upwardly mobile, socioeconomically, we wanted to bring in um, those resources as well. And this was done on the same day as our job fair. So it was a really um, big success. Next, please. Okay, these are just some of the pictures from the Housing Expo and how we um, did that, at the, um, conducted it at the gym. Okay, next. So the second um, success for us was um, in addition to, you know, focusing on home ownership, City of Norcross, another way that they are extremely unique, they house 14 extended stays inside their, the city limits. This is a city of just 17,000 in population. Um, so basically, if you count the extended stay units as a housing, as a household, um, they re it represents about 10 to 12 percent of the city's population. So on any given day, between about approximately 10 percent of the city's population is residing in an extended stay. Um, with the Norcross, not inside the city limits, but with the Norcross area um, address houses a third of the county's extended stays. So what we wanted to do is we just we knew just um, through our work in the with housing, we knew that a lot of families reside there, but we just did not know how many, what the extent is, um, and how, you know, what are some of their barriers that they face in finding more stable housing. 
So after several weekends of knocking on doors, um, the main finding that we came with is that 84% of those that responded were using extended stays as a place of residence. And this is again how we were collecting local da data and information that down the road actually uh, helped uh, influence the city's policy. Um, and some of the major barriers that we've identified were um, inability to save because these folks were paying more for motels than they would be in the apartments and, you know, having um, a poor credit history, especially if there's an eviction on their credit, um, they would not be able, they can't get into an apartment. So we took all of those findings to create a program. Um, and um, next slide, please. This is what came out of it. Um, United Way approached us and they gave us uh, $25,000 and the city of Norcross matched that grant. So uh, with $50,000, we created a pilot program to move these families from extended stays and into apartments. And um, St. Vincent de Paul has been leading this effort. So um, it's been truly successful. It's been you know, a steep learning curve, um, navigating the private sector but um, and their barriers to admitting these families. But uh, the city of Norcross, because it really, truly helped a lot of families, they have implemented another $25,000 renewal. So we'll be continuing this um, into the next year. Um, and this work, it, it really influenced a lot of other jurisdictions um, to um, duplicate the survey or just to customize it for their own. Okay, next please. So, in terms of, you know, we also wanted to look at the affordable rental housing that is quality. And um, um, what we did is using um, home funds, um, the nonprofit that I represent, the Gwinnett Housing Corporation, we ended up acquiring a duplex um, in the target area, and it is walking school, uh, walking distance to elementary and middle school. And this is the place where we put some of the families that were in the program that I just talked about that we were transitioning from extended stays um, into apartments. So it's a two year program and it gives them an opportunity to save money. They're paying half of what they were paying in the extended stay. And of course, they work with their case managers. Children are able to have their own rooms so they can um, uh, focus on their schoolwork. And um, this was just a ribbon cutting ceremony that we celebrated with the city. Okay, next. Um, another uh, success, this one is still pending, but we're always looking how to create more affordable housing. Uh, so the, ci the city is already developed. It's an older city. There's really not that much more room for new construction. Um, and our goal was to um, do a land swap with the county right next to a high school. And we wanted to create a model where we're putting in these transitional housing units for the families that are in extended stays, right next to the schools, all three schools in the city, um, so the students can, again, uh, avoid the stigma of being in an extended stay and also uh, be able to walk to the school if, in case there's a transportation barrier. Um, so we realized at that time the city was very interested, but they did not have a redevelopment authority. Um, so we brought in Chris Norman. He is a regular speaker at GIC. So that was a great resource for us um, that we've met through GIC. And um, he talked to us about the difference between land bank authority and the redevelopment authority. Um, so they helped us put us on the right track so we can accomplish some of those other goals. Next. OK, so I just wanted us um, just to talk a little bit about since our GIC program ended, um, this was obviously pre-COVID-19, but um, you can see the brand, you know, we printed t-shirts because every time we go into the community, um, we really want our brand to be known. We want the residents there to know that we're here advocating for them. A lot of times, you know, policies are made by, uh, from the top down, they're not that often influenced from the actual, you know, what we call uh, boots on the ground. and. Uh, what we're providing, the kind of um, services that we're providing to the city is we talk to these families and we conduct surveys um, and we talk just like we did with extended stays. We talk to them, what are the barriers? And all of that data helps shape their policy and the programs that we bring. So here, what we did is we uh, just 
um, went to the apartment complexes to again talk to the families to see what their satisfaction is with the program, with the with the community, with the property management. What is the shape of the um, of, of the properties? Are they being maintained? And then again, is there interest in the home ownership? And what would they like to see? And next, please. And I'm going to go through these quickly, but um. Basically, like one of the findings was that the vast majority of the renters in the target area were Hispanic and African American. Next. Um, and we also realize that the vast majority of them do want to be, become homeowners, but they do face multiple obstacles. Um, for example, 75, um, let me see here. Um, majority of the renters, yes, want to be homeowners but um they do 75 percent said that they face obstacles next and the biggest obstacles to home ownership was insufficient and poor credit no savings for the down payment assistance and they don't even know where to get started so this is the information that we use when we go back to the city of norcross how how we can best serve the community based on what the actual real needs are in real time next please um, you can go through the next slide. Next. Um, what we also, you know, what we did is we just took some pictures so that we could share with the code enforcement, um, just basically health and safety um, hazards that need to be implemented. Um, and you can go in the next one as well. But what was really interesting for us, if you look at the picture on the left, is sometimes even in the complexes that really weren't um, maintained by the property management, the families and residents there took great pride in their community and great care. Um, and this, a lot of them have been just long-term residents. Next. So these are um, basically our policy suggestion um, after the uh, apartment survey was to do a more housing expos, probably on an annual basis, to help them with that down payment assistance hurdle. There are a lot of organizations in Winnett County that, that provide down payment assistance. Um, we also want to bring in uh, credit building and repair nonprofits. We, uh, they were here with us on the last housing expo and they actually had a breakaway session that was really, really impactful. Um, so we'll have more housing expo and um, just other policy recommendations on how to keep the uh, private property managers more accountable when it comes to maintenance of their properties next so what we wanted what we're going to be doing is um, again the moving from here the, this gig program has really helped us just not only you know with the technical assistance but the facilitator uh, dr watkins i have to give him a shout out he's been amazing and he's really walked us through the process um he was patient with us and um just the hearing from the other cities um we've learned so much and we've created such a momentum and the city of norcross really appreciates everything that we've done with all of the volunteers um, we wanted to keep that going and our goal is to um, incorporate live norcross as its own nonprofit. but in the meantime as, as the live norcross itself builds capacity it's going to come under the umbrella of our Gwinnett housing corporation so that we can leverage our grant writing experience. And um, basically, we're going to put it under the, our, the non housing nonprofit, and um, it will stay there with an advisory board um, strictly from the city of Norcross and the, the GIC members. And um, we're going to build capacity so that in a couple of years, it can be a standalone nonprofit so we can continue doing the great work. And that's it. Thank you, Layla. I really appreciate that. And thank you, everyone, um, Randy and Kate, for um, coming on and talking about your experience. Um, we also have Jermaine Durham, who I just want to give a quick shout out to, who um, is the GIG program director at UGA, who's on the call. Thanks so much for being here. Um, if y'all have questions, we'll open it up in just a second uh, for Q&A. But if y'all have questions, he's a great resource as well. Um, so we'll be keeping track of all the questions you might have. Um, and would be happy to answer them. Um, but for right now, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda because we have a couple, let's see, we have 15 more minutes and we have a couple of pointed questions we want to ask to our panelists and then uh, open up the floor uh, for you all to ask questions as well. 
But thank you, Kristen. Before we get to that, just wanted to add, we're talking about homeownership and down payment assistance. Please keep in mind that we have a program at DCA under the Georgia Dream Program where we do provide down payment assistance to first time home buyers across the state. So if uh, you're not aware of that uh, and don't have that information, please let us know because we can certainly get some some uh, representatives out to talk with you about the uh, Georgia Dream Program. So sorry, I had to add that. <laughs> Uh, so I guess if the if uh, the pan if the panelists could tell us uh, about the collaboration and partnership and how they worked with that in in your uh, in developing your uh, team's work plan. So if anybody wants to comment on that, that would be great. Yeah, I'll chime in. So Kate Hogan with the City of Seattle. Um, I think GIC does a really good job through the application process to help you really pull those strategic partners in. We have somebody from Habitat for Humanity, Family Connections, Family Promise, a strong nonprofit background who are already affordable housing minded on our team. And we took most of our large negative voices from the low income housing tax credit projects before we were in the GIC program, we took them and actually pulled them onto the team so that we already knew that there were loud, trusted voices in our communities that we could use for grass, grassroots um, spread of knowledge. And so that has been extremely helpful while we're trying to re-educate the community while also re-educating staff and council so that we can all be on the same page as far as what is affordable housing and really everybody's entitled to affordable housing. So I think GIC in and of itself, the whole program is designed to help you pull together that strong sense of collaboration and partnership um, even from the early stages as far as application goes. Hi. Hi, this is Layla with the City of Norcross. What we did um, when we set, set up our teams is um, we looked at the challenges of the cities facing. So one of them was lack of quality, affordable rental. Um, and then the second one was how do we increase the home ownership? The third one was um, there, the existing housing stock is already aging and it might need some sprucing up. Um, so we took, uh, all of that work and we divided our work into the committees and then each committee um, was uh, made of individuals who specialize in that area so for example for our home ownership committee we had the um, down payment assistance providers we had the financial literacy nonprofits um, and we had the lenders we had real estate agents in the homeowner rehab program and you know dca offers the chip program we actually um received an award for another city for 300,000, but we put in Habitat and um, they have um, their own homeowner rehab program. So um, they took on that committee. So each committee tackled um, the specific issue that the city was facing. And, and that's how we, we were really strategic in which partners we brought on board. Okay, and it looks like Randy, um were you able to unmute your microphone, Randy, or? Yes, ma'am, I was. I, I, agree. Okay. <laughs> I agree with uh, both the speaker. The collaboration and partnership, that's very vital to your team's success. We uh, we did the same thing. You know, we pretty well handpicked our folks that, you know, has proven leadership ability and can get to help get things done. On my team, I have two actual city council members who, who uh, you talk about trying to get buy-in from people uh, when I first started, we first started about going to get first time we applied for GIC, we wasn't accepted. So we knew we had to get our game going. So we actually moved forward and we didn't slow down a bit for the previous, you know, next year we was rocking and rolling. We was doing everything. We got the, my position is a new position here. City Marshal's a new position here. Our main street director is a new position here. So the city's actually spent a lot of money to, make an ADL a better place to be, live, and especially the housing. So um, the team, what you, the selection of the team is the most important, and of course the collaboration and partnership. If you don't do that, you won't succeed at all. That's just my opinion. Great, thank you. Let's go ahead, uh, Kristen, and look at a couple of the questions we have in the chat. Uh, where would a list of gig communities be published? 
Yes, thanks, Brenda. Um, so we do have a full list of our Git communities, I believe past and present. It's actually up on um, UGA's Git website, which I will advance the slides really quickly so that you can see it. Um, so it's gonna be here on this website. And then obviously, um, Dwayne and I keep a list of those. So if you need um, like an Excel spreadsheet, please feel free to uh, get an email and we will be happy to provide that to you. But it, it's up, it's public information on the website you see on your screen. Okay, the, another question in the chat is, if you're a Git community, can you apply for a CG housing at the same time you apply for a water or sewer CDGB? So um, thank you for the question. I, I see also the latter part of the question, which yeah. asks about being able to apply annually. And so having the Git designation does give you the ability to be exempt from the every other year rule um, that's laid out in the CDBG application, which um, essentially says uh, basically if you, for example, apply in FY19 and receive the fund, you generally would have to wait until FY21 to be able to apply and receive funds again. But uh, with that gig designation, you are exempt from that rule. So you would be able to apply and possibly receive funds um, on an annual basis with the designation. Kristen. Yes. Can I say something? Absolutely. What we did in ADEL is the uh, the three target areas that we uh, picked has already had a CDBG for water and sewer and upgrades in that area. So that's why we picked that area. And that's what we've been doing, kind of get all that handled before we start doing stuff with houses, because that's the first step is your water and sewer upgrade and all that. So that's just an idea too, by the way. Absolutely. Any right. other questions in the chat box? I uh, don't see any more. Um, we can awesome. go to our uh, number, our other question. What are some best practices you found while working with partners in your community on affordable housing solutions? Have any comments on that? I, I like something. The, uh the most important thing I could stress is the fact that you have to get the citizens and the city's buy-in. You know, if you go to somebody's house and say, hey, we're we going to refurbish your house, and they look at you like, why are you going to do that? No one's ever done that before. You know, we, we, we actually contact churches here, and they put it out to their uh, members, and we, we, you know, of course, we use that a lot. But you really got to get the word, the word out of what you're trying to do, and then people understand that you're actually trying to help them. I think that's very important. Hi, this is Layla with City of Norcross. For us, I think the biggest lesson here would be to not be afraid to roll up your sleeves and um, meet your community and talk to them. Um, like I said before, so much policy is really, you know, influenced just based on some theories or just top down. And very often in different municipalities and different cities, uh, usually decision makers do live in a bubble. And it's really important to go and talk to the community and have these kind of surveys um, um, that will give you the feedback that is that I find is consistently lacking. And only then are your programs really going to be effective because the policies and programs that come, you know, the result from that are actually going to be addressing the needs of your community. Hey, Hogan here with the city of Centerville. Um, I agree with both Randy and Layla. I mean, it's so important to get those on the ground connections because you can't really do much during eight to five, Monday through Friday, um, this program's got to be personal. It's got to be in the neighborhoods that need your attention. And sometimes it's going to be a Saturday morning work day with some volunteers and or Friday night talking to residents in an area that's one of your target areas. And I think not being afraid of getting into some of the target areas, you know, they may be rougher, but I think that it's one of those things where you really have to bite the bullet and have to have those on the ground connections to be able to 
proactively create a reputation for yourself because after you proactively do that you don't have to be as reactive people are bringing you projects before they're even a sailing home or before a neighborhood's really starting to feel down and out about their neighborhood sign and that proactivity is really going to save your housing team time as far as spinning their wheels making sure they're doing some quality work It sounds like building trust. <laughs> okay, so um, our last one is just lessons learned uh, or challenges, challenges you experienced during the partnership and collaboration. I can start, I guess. I, I would say the, the the most, the biggest challenge that we had to deal with was COVID-19, of course, because it changed everything, how we operated. We, um, in our city, we was divided up into teams and we worked two days a week and we was off seven days, whatever. And everybody, no one else was working but us because we you know, considered essential. But um, that was definitely a getting used to because everything kind of was on hold. We, you know, as far as doing stuff with the housing, you know, nobody would come talk to you. Everybody was, didn't want to be out in the public, which I understand that. And an, another problem that we're experiencing right now is air property. I don't know if the rest of y'all have problems with that, but we was going to apply for a CDBG housing last year. And we actually got into the nuts and bolts and found out, you know, there's a lot of air property. So we're trying to tackle that now. Yeah, I think that's uh, a big issue. I actually just had someone contact me that wanted to talk about uh, solutions to some of the air properties uh, that they're facing. So I think that is something you may have to deal with on uh, older properties, especially. Miss Brenda. Miss Brenda. Yes. I'd like to add one other thing, if you don't mind. I've actually partnered with a probate judge here in Cook County, and there. Uh -huh. Um, a, a lady who the, she, her husband had passed away and the house was in his name. So the probate judge actually took care of that and they have funds to take care of stuff like that. So he, he stepped up and he helped us. So we're actually uh, doing a chip grant on her house. Wow. So well, don't fantastic. forget about the local politicians, your judges, because especially a probate judge, because he could help you a lot too. And my judge is very, he, he, he's just very helpful. He's a really good guy. Good information. Thank you, Randy. Do we have anything else? Yeah, Kate from Centerville here. I would just say one of the lessons we learned and kind of by accident was just having that housing assessment done before we got into the program. I think it really helped us hit the ground running and making sure that we were starting off with very, um, very specific projects instead of worrying about the six months to a year to get that housing team or that housing assessment done to really understand what our housing stock looked like. And I can't say enough about the Middle Georgia Regional Commission, um, Greg Boyke and Ms. Laura Mathis and their team. They are fantastic and they helped us with that housing assessment, knocked it out in a couple of weeks and it was a drive by um, picture of every single housing structure in the city of Centerville. And it truly just helped us hit the ground running when we started the program. Okay. Well, thank you all. I'm going back over to Kristen um, to do a wrap up, wrap up for the uh, session. Thanks so much, Brenda, and thank you again, um, Randy, Kate, and Layla, for hopping on and sharing your experiences uh, with the audience here today. Um, I just want to leave you all with my contact information, and very quickly, if I can, we got a um, question about how get communities uh, maybe deal with NIMBYism, so not in my backyard. Um, I think that's an ongoing discussion and um, Jermaine at UGA and his team have done a great job of kind of curating some content at our um, retreats where we talk specifically about that because I think that um, it's something that a lot of our communities face. Um, so I think that's a, it's a very detailed answer and probably longer than um, we have time for today, but um, if you want to email me with any additional questions, um, I have my contact information here and have left um, where you can find more information about GIC. 
Um, but I think we're at time. So thank you all again today. And I hope you've been enjoying our first ever virtual uh, fall conference at DCA. Thanks so much for joining.